I'm Susan Weisbauer, co-author of The Well-Trained Mind. And I'm Susanna Jarrett, editor at The Well-Trained Mind Press. And we're talking about education for all parents and for all children in all sorts of settings. And today we have with us a returning guest, Courtney Ostash. Hi, I'm a homeschool parent and a math instructor and a science instructor at the Well-Trained Mind Academy. And I'm the author of How to Homeschool the Kids You Have. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're going to have so much fun. Yes. Thanks for coming back. Um, we're excited to have you, especially um, to hear your takes on science. This season on the podcast, we've been talking about nuts and bolts and teaching different subjects. And so we're diving into teaching science the classical way today. So it's going to be a lot of fun. We'll start with a quick overview of specific strategies for teaching science at every stage of the classical progression. But um, afterwards, we're going to dish on some popular science curriculum. We're going to get your hot takes, Courtney, on. Mm -hmm. I know you've got a lot of experience using a lot of different science curricula. Um, so I'm really excited to get started. So we're probably going to spend most of our time, because I actually think that's what's going to be most helpful to you out there, our listeners, talking about specific curricula. But we did just want to start by sort of summarizing what we see as the goals of science education in the classical curriculum. And a lot of this is stuff that we've covered in The Well-Trained Mind, but it's always helpful to just sort of do an overview mm -hmm. um, so, so that you guys, you know, you know where we're coming from. So we're just going to start right in with grammar stage. Grammar stage science is what you do with elementary students. And what I always say to parents who are doing um, elementary science is don't expect too much. Mm. Not because kids aren't capable, but because they don't yet. Well, two reasons, really. First is that they don't yet really have the background information that they need in order to do science. They need a, they need to know a lot about the natural world, about principles, about how the world functions before they can actually, quote unquote, do science. So you really need to think of these elementary years more in terms of exploration and and just finding out fun stuff. You don't have to worry so much about having a quote unquote science program. And then also, I think it's important to keep in mind that elementary school students are doing a lot of basic skill building. Mm -hmm. They're working on their reading, on their writing. They're working on their math. Um, they're working on all of those sort of supporting skills that are going to help them be good scientists in the future. But during the elementary years, that just takes a lot of energy. And you really need to prioritize that for them rather than getting stuck on how many hours a week are we going to do science. Courtney, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And I think um, one of the ways that you can do that is simply by, like you said, introducing them to the natural world. Let's go to the park. Let's mm -hmm. go to the Arboretum. Let's go to the Botanic Garden. And all of that time spent is well spent. Yeah. Yeah. And kids are so excited to find stuff out at this stage of education. So your goal really just needs to be help them gather basic information and really just cultivate that sense of amazement and the habit of looking at the world around them. Right. And it's it's interesting to hear you say all that. What I'm hearing is it's not something to stress about too much at this age, but science can be a lot of fun for little kids because we're so surrounded by opportunities to explore the world and talk about science. I was recently babysitting my niece and nephew and we're taking a walk and they kept finding bugs and they're just <laughs> looking at the world. They at being these little children who are so excited about gathering knowledge are seeing things I wouldn't see on a walk. I wouldn't even have noticed the grasshopper on the side of the road, but they did and wanted to pick it up and look at it and observe it carefully. And um, so there's so much you can do with that, with all of that enthusiasm that they have. And as part of cultivating that enthusiasm, you should pick um, an approach mm -hmm. that helps you to do that with your kids. I know in The Well-Trained Mind, we discuss that uh, you can teach, you can sort of focus on one field a year, biology, earth science, mm -hmm. astronomy, studying the sky, uh, basic chemistry, sort of, you know, beginning physical science. You can take one subject and focus on it all year long and really sort of organize your explorations around that. Or you can teach a whole variety of skills and topics throughout the year and spend some time emphasizing how those disciplines connect to each other. And in The Well-Trained Mind, we do offer several different scenarios, uh, several different patterns that would 
fall into these different approaches that you can follow with elementary students. But I do think that whatever approach you choose, we do have some things for you to keep in mind. Susanna, would you like to tell us what they are? Yes, absolutely. The first one would be to avoid boring books. Yes. Even, even avoid textbooks. You don't need a biology textbook necessarily for your young, young student. Um, you want science to be fun and interesting and exciting. And there are so many books out in the world by people who are particularly excited about butterflies or particularly mm -hmm. excited about the human body to look for those, what we call living books, books written by authors who, who have a care for that particular subject that are beautifully illustrated, that have literary value. These living books are going to excite your kids about, um, about science more than saying, okay, we're going to go through from A to E in the science encyclopedia today or, or in a, a dry textbook. And this is a great time to make the use of the library because the best science books to use with young children are ones that are just packed full of gorgeous illustrations and photos to really bring in that visual aspect. And those can be super, super expensive. Mm -hmm. So having a regular habit of just going to the library and checking out books on different scientific topics is, I think, you know, actually probably better than trying to follow a formal science curriculum in these early years. Mm. And I remember as a kid, one of my favorite parts of the week was going to the library and finding the section for what we were learning about that week and finding the best books mm -hmm. in that section. And it's a much cheaper way. If you do need book lists, there's so many um, places where you can start, whether that's talking to your librarian or going to the Well Try Mind now has a curriculum recommendations portal with uh, with good suggestions there, or even book lists. There are whole curriculums that are organized around living books. And mm -hmm. so even without purchasing the whole curriculum sometimes for a, for a program like Build Your Library, which I think we're going to talk about later. Uh, Courtney is, um, they have, you can look at their book lists online for free and kind of get ideas for things to look at. One of the things that I think is really important as a parent who's like been recently been there and done that, my youngest is 10 this year, is that picture books are really good. And you may be like, oh, my child can read. My child doesn't need a picture book. But you know what? It, for this, picture books are beautiful. And there can mm. be very elaborate, very high level picture books with very good illustrations of detail and vocabulary. So like, don't be afraid to, to use those picture books. Mm. I really love you emphasizing that because I think there can be a tendency among people who are doing classical education to try to go for this sort of appearance of rigor by mm. maybe pushing children to work at a higher level than they really need to be working. And it's so important for us to remember that when you're doing science with an elementary student, you're teaching them to look carefully at the world. So what better way to practice that than a picture book of something that, you know, they can't, you can't take them unless you live in Iceland up to the edge of a volcano and let them look at the lava, but they can observe the world through these gorgeous pictures. And that's such an important thing for them to be doing. Right. And speaking to that point about at this point, in their education that you're really teaching them to think carefully about the world. Um, another thing that you can bring in are, are experiments or, or demonstrations at this age, they're not really doing true experiments yet, but they're, you can do demonstrations that in interest and inspire them to think carefully about how things work. And I think Courtney, you had some thoughts on experiments versus demonstrations. Oh, absolutely. So it is uh, May when we're recording this. And I don't know about you, but at my house, we have been busy gardening. Oh, yes. And gardening is a biology, right? We got plants, you got soil chemistry, you got amending the soil, you have thinking about worms, you have, you know, all, vermiculite, all of this, you want to make a healthy plant, you think about pollinators, the act of having a garden, and even if you live like in a tiny apartment in a city, you can still grow plants. Right? So right. like, you know, that's really important. And having pets, whether mm -hmm. it's a goldfish or a dog or a cat, or maybe you have a working dog, right, out there herding your sheep, all of all of that is still working with biology, that zoology. And then I, I live kind of out in the country a little bit, and both of my children are in 4-H, which not everybody is familiar with 4-H, but mm -hmm. 
it's a program run through the extension service of land grant universities, so usually state universities. And they have really rigorous curriculum aimed for this age group about gardening and pets and animals and all of that good stuff. And there are so many beautiful nature study curricula. Mm. that you can do throughout the year. So all of that is biology. We might not be a biology textbook, right? Mm -hmm. But it's biology and it's okay to make a year of that, especially when they're little. Sure. Right. You know, and then for astronomy, to, to think about the wonder of the universe, to take your child out on a dark night and do stargazing can't be beat. I really don't think there's a way that you can beat that to introduce them to the beauty of the Milky Way. And then, you know, you can think about how lenses work and you can hang a prism in the window and make rainbows and you can make mud pies and look at different kinds of rocks and learn about weather and weather safety. And then See, the I next want you to year... homeschool me. That sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next year, I bought, I don't know how big it was, but it was a big bag. It was like a 20 pound bag of rice size. So it was a big bag of baking, baking soda. And one of those five gallon containers, maybe not five, maybe like three and a half, but it was a giant container of vinegar. Right. And so I put those in the baking center in my kitchen. And so my kids could at any time come in and make the like the fizzy, the fizzy volcanoes. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, right? With the, and then they got into doing it with food dye and then they got to measuring different proportions. But that's chemistry. Right. Right. That's chemistry. And then if you do tie dye clothes or you want to get really nature crunchy with it and make your own paints or, you know, make your own soaps or make your own bath bombs like those little fizzy things. Right you know mm -hmm. that's all chemistry and then there's physics i mean if you just if you're throwing a party and you have a glass with condensation and you put ice in it and then you have evaporation you leave it outside and then there's an icy day and it's freezing you can talk about that in terms of heat take them to a, a ball game take them to a baseball game and then you can learn about force and mass and acceleration and vectors woo that one was a home run <laughs> <laughs> and then you have optics with mirrors and then they take them swimming and they get the thing off the bottom of the pool and it's not where they reach for it. So then we're talking about refraction of light and then you have magnets. Like this can be fun. Yeah. It can be fun. All of this is fun. So you can really, you can really lean into delight centered learning with elementary science and stop worrying that you're going to miss things because that's so not the point mm -hmm. of doing elementary school science. Now, Obviously, then, as you move on into the middle grades, you're going to want to you're going to want to um, change your tactics just a little bit. Of course, you still want it to be fun. So let's not forget about, you know, it's fifth grade. It's time to really work hard at this now. So let, let's keep doing these wonderful projects and exploring the world. But it is time now for children to begin to learn about um, scientific principles, scientific laws and rules, really sort of putting words to their observations, learning the reasons why the world works the way that it does, um, really making sense of all that great careful looking that they've been doing. So during the logic stage, um, and we'll talk about this a bit more, I'm sure, as we're talking about specific curricula, there are really, I think, three things that that needs to incorporate. There's learning the scientific principles. So all the laws and rules, scientific descriptions. So mm -hmm. how to give careful descriptions of the world or how to describe um, the steps of something that happens again and again and again, like a volcanic eruption. And then third would be scientific classification, why we put certain objects into certain categories. So the periodic table of elements, the taxonomy of animals. And I, th I think, Courtney, you had some thoughts on that. I did. One of the things that I noticed, because I've been teaching science for a while, is that students tend to think that these things are immutable, that they mm. never change. And it's really important to think of science as like an ongoing process. Mm. We're never like completely done with stuff. Right. And so when I was like in the seventh grade ish, so what, 12, 13 around yeah. there, we, it was very firmly, you know, kingdom, violent class, order, family, genus, species, right? That's certainly what I learned. Yep. Right. But apparently today they're doing cladistics. So. And, and what is cladistics for those so, of us who are older? 
<laughs> so it's not just sorting by observable characteristics, by sorting um, sort of, uh, well, really, as far as I can tell, by DNA. So mm. things that don't necessarily look like they're related might actually be more related and things that are not necessarily that we would assume are closely related actually can be. So they use this sort of DNA analysis. Mm -hmm. And that's not the only thing they're refining. Because I don't know about you, but when I was in high school and we learned about atoms, right? Like there's the center of the atom and then you have those little orbital shells around them. Like, it looks like the solar system. Yeah, 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 like the solar system. And I was so shocked when I found out that's not actually what atoms look like. <laughs> right? <laughs> A little, a little disturbing. So, but now they're doing this electron configuration model, and it's about statistical probabilities of finding an electron, and they're spin up and spin down, and it's really complicated. So learning that how we think about these things changes as scientists learn, mm -hmm. knowing that this can change is actually, I think, really important. And it it just that's such a great point because it also makes science more interesting in some ways. I remember as a, as a young kid, there was a point in my life where I wanted to be an explorer, but I got it in my head that everything had been explored. You know, there, there are all these books about the people who went and discovered Antarctica and all these places. And I thought there was nothing left for me, but the reality is we're learning new things every day in science. We're exploring the universe. We're exploring the bottom of the deep blue sea. There's so much that is changing in science as we learn more. And so I think for kids to start to know that and recognize, recognize that actually sets them up for the rhetoric stage when they're learning about kind of the progression of science and the development of scientific ideas and theories, giving them that idea that like, yeah, this isn't set a stone. This is a, this is a practice that, that is like you were using the word refine Courtney, which is a great word. So I would say as a, and it's really fascinating listening to you, you guys talk about this because you're right. It makes science seem so much more like an adventure mm -hmm. um, than what I think a lot of us, particularly those of us who are non-scientists think of, which is I got to work my way through this textbook and learn all the things. But it does seem to me that at this point during the logic stage, again, particularly if you yourself are not a scientist, that having a formal curricula would be a really great help with this because there is so much out there that maybe you're not even aware that kids need to be learning about. Oh, absolutely. I am all in on having something with when the coffee baker's broken and the baby's sick. And, uh, you know, I was up at three with them and like, I just need something I can hold on to for today's mm -hmm. lesson. <laughs> and also just then that that can if you pick the right curricula, it can kind of open up some of these questions that maybe you hadn't thought about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's hard to guide a student into something that you're you're not an expert in when it begins to get more complex as middle grade science does. That makes a lot of sense. And and also just to reiterate, like we said at the beginning, that with these curricula for middle grades, a lot of them do emphasize those experiments, those demonstrations, those hands-on projects, so that there you can, without working too hard and exhausting yourself too much, balance out this study of laws and principles and classification with hands-on fun projects that drive it home. Right. And you do have to remember, and this will be sort of maybe our segue into talking about rhetoric stage or high school science. You do also then have to keep in mind that the goal of logic stage science is not a complete understanding of the field. It's not mastery of it. You know, it's not really developing a deep expertise in this because, again, they're still not quite ready for that. They're still building those basic skills. It's really imp just more important that they continue to have an enthusiasm for science, but that they do get some exposure to these principles the rules and laws, um, and the ways in which scientists classify and um, order the world. Because as they move into high school, that is really when you get really deeply into the scientific principles and rules. And ideally, by the time the kid gets into high school, this rhetoric stage science, um, their reading and math skills uh, are no longer a challenge. They can actually use those to learn rather than struggling hard to read, struggling hard to do math. And most high school science at this point, I think a textbook is really useful. Science textbooks have a very well-organized, uh, well-structured method of presenting the principles in chemistry, in physics, in biology, in astronomy, in each one of the fields. So there's nothing wrong in the classical 
curriculum at this point in going to a more standard science textbook. But I do think that there are a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, So let me offer a couple and then Courtney, I'll I'll ask you for your thoughts. I think it's very important uh, that we teach science. And I've said this often, it's in the well-trained mind as well. Within the larger context of the study of ideas, it's so important for students to remember that science itself develops over time. Science textbooks, I feel like, do a (laughs) deceptively good job of presenting themselves as the last word on the subject. Mm -hmm. And we always have to remind our students that scientific theories that we now hold may be proved wrong in the future, or as you're talking about, Courtney, with the the structure of the, the atom, maybe a little bit more complicated or conceptualized differently in the future. It is really worth taking some time. And I know in Well-Trained Mind, we recommend that students do some reading in scientific literature from past centuries, just to give them some sense of how the study of science has developed over time. It's really worth continuing to point out that science is a human endeavor. And not only the questions that we ask, but the answers that we come up with are affected by our place in history, our concerns, what we think about the value of this earth, what we think about human life and what it is. All of these sort of bigger philosophical questions really do play into the learning of science. I would agree with that. And I would also add in that I think that if you if you do a couple of things on one is that you teach about the people that it makes it more interesting for students who are not necessarily that into science. Right. Right. You broaden your appeal of science that way. And I think the other thing is that one of the good things about people that I think are kind of underrated is that we build things and building things like makes life better. Like I certainly am very grateful to the inventor of air conditioning. Right. Yes. <laughs> but also in science, a lot of change happens because we get better at building things like telescopes or, you know, um, uh, microscopes or whatever. And so when you bring that, that we didn't always have this technology, we didn't always have it this way, that these people were interesting people and that they they worked with that, you bring that history in, it kind of helps to to widen, to broaden, and to see where the future questions for those, for the students who are really into science, who just love whatever this particular subject is, these are the areas that we don't know, because these are the questions that are being asked, and we don't necessarily have the technology right now to answer that. Mm -hmm. Those, you know, provides them uh, paths for future study. So doing that is good for everybody. And then as well as these sort of more, uh, philosophical things that we want to keep in mind for rhetoric stage science. We also have to remember the science lab. (laughs) Science labs in high school are very important. Um, They're a requirement, I believe, Courtney, for most college admissions. I just checked my three closest universities and yep. Yep. (laughs) They want biology and chemistry and physics specifically, my my locals. Oh, interesting. You should check your locals too. Yep. So you so for rhetoric stage science, yes, we're going to have to you know make some space to have a bit more of a biographical approach. Maybe reading about some of the scientists um, who are making these advances. We're going to need a good organized study of principles. But yes, you're also going to need to arrange for a science lab. And of course, there's so many different ways to do this. I know at uh, at the Well Trained Mind Academy, we offer sort of an online science lab option. A lot of times, you can cooperate with your local school or community college to do a lab. Um, Many of these curricula that we're going to talk about have some sort of lab offering as part of them, but definitely you've got to keep that in mind as you're planning out your rhetoric stage science. So having said all that, right, so we've, we've done a little overview here of what to do, which is basically have fun, get a little bit more serious, and then make sure you do those labs. Um, that's my summary of <laughs> grammar, <laughs> grammar, logic, and rhetoric stage. Um, I think especially once they move out of the elementary area, most parents really are probably going to want a curricula. Just Mm -hmm. give them some, a spine, some organization and a plan. So Courtney, you're not only a science teacher, but, but as a homeschool parent, you have been a, a phenomenally, um, (laughs) 
<laughs> What's the word I'm looking for here? A good wide, shopper. I have purchased many. <laughs> you have purchased many. Wide ranging sampler of science curricula. I have. And I think part of that is because I've very few of them that I actually like. So none of them. <laughs> well, you know, you keep looking, right? It's like you're right. looking for the perfect t-shirt. It doesn't exist, but I keep looking. I keep hoping maybe this one is it. So I have purchased a lot of them. We have tried a lot of them. We're very, I guess we're sciencey people at my house. I love science. I have a teaching certification in science and my oldest just adores science in general. So I keep looking for something. So. Um, All right. Well, let's, Let's do some specifics here. And Susanna, maybe you want to um, sort of walk us through the labels because that's yes. important. Yeah. So when you're looking at homeschool science curriculum specifically, um, they're often labeled as either Christian, secular, or neutral. And I think it'll be helpful to have um, definitions for each of those. So a Christian science curriculum is is taught from a Christian worldview. And often that can specifically mean that it endorses creationism or the idea that the earth is 6,000 years old. Not all Christians believe that. So just to be careful with that, if you're a Christian who doesn't believe in creationism, that that may be what you're getting when you look at a Christian curriculum. It may also include verses and, you know, using science um, as kind of a, a gateway to the worship of, of God. Right. And then a secular curriculum explicitly teaches evolution, the theory of evolution and the neutral, this gets where a little bit trickier. It's kind of a mixed bag. So if you see the label neutral on your homeschool science curriculum, it could mean that they basically avoid the topic of evolution as much as possible. That's easier to do in like the elementary grades that kind mm. of just tiptoe around it. Um, or also kind of tiptoe around Earth origins, more controversial uh, topics, or that they teach those things, but they have content warnings for parents. So they like say, these are the chapters where we teach about evolution, uh, take it or leave it, or that they are teaching with the underlying philosophy of intelligent design, which is not necessarily that the earth is 6,000 years old, but that it seems like that there was design and intent in the development of the universe. Um, so those are the three labels, Christian, secular, and neutral. Because neutral is a bit of a mixed bag, um, you're definitely going to want to look into it deeper if you see that label and see if it aligns with what you want to be doing in your homeschool. All of the curricula that we're talking about today, just to be clear, are neutral or secular. We're not um, reviewing Christian curriculum. And I would I would say too that just so you know, there can be a fair amount of um, passionate feeling among secular scientists about curricula that are labeled neutral mm -hmm. because they often view these curricula as sort of um, underground attempts to sneak creationism in without anybody noticing. Mm. So when you start looking at curricula, you may you may see a fair amount of rhetoric um, <laughs> directed at those quote unquote neutral curricula. So this is one of those, you know, your mileage may vary. You're going to on this point, you're going to have to look a little deeper if you choose to use one of those curricula. But with that being said, I'm excited to hear your thoughts, Courtney, on some of these. I guess we should just go through elementary and then rhetoric and I mean, logic and rhetoric stage curricula and uh, get your strengths and weaknesses and hot takes on some of these popular programs. Well, I will tell you, the very first one I ever bought was Elemental Science. Mm hmm. And it has a lot of things that I really liked about it. It's got these hands-on things that you do every week, these projects. Um, you have your students use nice books. The book, the book I think, it was a DK book, if I remember. It was had a white cover. Mm -hmm. They have these narration pages. I think narration and science is super important. Have the students be able to summarize verbally what they read. Very important. And the other thing, as a busy parent, is it had a two-day schedule and a five-day schedule, which I really oh liked nice. and it had memory work um, you know this is a stage where we want them to be gathering that information and, and gathering means putting it into the brain which is your memory work is super helpful and it had lots of writing which did not go over well so, mm. <laughs> so that could be either a strength or a weakness depending on how yes. your how your kids work yeah yeah, yeah. um now i speaking of this those hot hot things if 
for it does not if i recall correctly it's been a little while did not explicitly teach it of evolution so some parents got really hot about that i didn't mind so much i mean the kid is six right so right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so and so there were there are a lot of moving parts like there was a teacher's guide and there was a student guide and there were other books and then there were more books and then there was drawing and like mm -hmm. that was a lot um, you know, if you got your toddler, like s taking the table, the book off the table and running around while you're trying to look for something else, it was a little much. And I like routines. Uh, the Not everybody likes routines. A lot of people see that as being very dry. You do this on Monday and this on Tuesday and this on Wednesday. My oldest got bored. So mm -hmm. we switched out of it. But I wasn't sad to switch out of it because I felt like it was a lot of, mm, shall we say, shallow knowledge. It didn't require a lot of thinking, but, you know, it depends on the student, right? You know, if you're looking for just, you, you got, you got to do science and you want to get her done. Like mm -hmm. this is a great program for that, I think. All right. So, and, and um, I should know this, remind me, what grades does this particular curricula offer? I want to say they go like through K through eight. Do I remember that correctly? Yeah, they have a logic stage version and a grammar stage version. Okay. So it goes through the logic stage. Okay, so that could possibly be an option for, for either one of those. Um, I mean, it does sound to me from your description like it might be a little bit more appropriate for elementary than for, for a logic stage. But here again, maybe depends on your student. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. Give us, give us your next, give us your next hot take, Courtney. <laughs> well, the next one I bought, this is all in order the way I bought them. So the next one I bought was the Real Science Odyssey. And for a long time, I got this confused with the Real Science for Kids. Mm -hmm. The Real oh, right. Science for Kids and Real Science Odyssey are not the same thing. Okay. <laughs> Just FYI. So I bought the Real Science Odyssey one, which is secular. And it did have lots of hands-on activities and it didn't require anything too weird. Like I didn't have to order from like a science supply store. So that was nice. Mm -hmm. And it was open and go, which is also super nice. Mm. But also there are lots of activities. And, mm -hmm. you know, and I had a toddler running around at the time and I was just like, I can't do all the things. Like I didn't have enough hours in the day. Um, and the, at least for mine, even when I bought it, like not all of the books, the supplemental books I recommended were in print. So like that was a problem. Um, but the, the main deal breaker at my house was, um, actually that it used comic sans. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your eyes bleed. <laughs> and she was, and she was just like, I'm not doing that. This is ugly. I don't want to look at it. I refuse. And I was like, okay. And the other thing is that a lot of the experiments felt like craft projects. Hmm. So it didn't feel like science to her, which I thought was interesting. Okay. All right. So I bought that and got rid of it again. And then you moved on to? And th then it was a rough couple of years. But my, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was. But n for my youngest, I actually, I, this year I'm using this Nancy Larson science. Hmm. So if you know Saxon math or mm -hmm. hate grammar, mm -hmm. this is that set of people. And okay. so it has that same direct instruction philosophy. It's open and go. It comes with a teacher's manual. You can buy a kit with like everything you need, which is great. Uh, photo cards and posters and trade books and review worksheets and workbooks with reading passages and diagrams. And you know what I really like? Because I'm a busy parent. Um, mm -hmm. it, is, it is just so easy to open and go and, and it's laid out and it, the science is rigorous. And then this has become, after all my experimenting, my favorite K through five science. Mm. So like um, we're, we're still working through the school year. I got really sick in February, so I had to take some time off, but we're still working through the school year. And so on Friday, my youngest identified tree leaves with a dichotomous key and she loved it. 
she's like, if it's this, it's this, if it's smooth, if it's rigid, if it's, uh, you know, palmate versus, I forget what the other one is, but she was like working through it. And we've set stuff on fire. Oh, well, how fun is that? <laughs> right? We burned marshmallows. We dyed stuff like the food coloring for celery, you know, to watch the xylem and the phloem. And we made different kinds of mud for tracking the differences in gravel and silt and clay. So I really like this. But there are a couple of things that not everybody else is going to like mm -hmm. because it is the science equivalent of like the Saxon math or the hate grammar, right? They tell you what to say. They tell you what the answer should be. Mm -hmm. And so it's not like a low key observation of the natural world, mm. right? A lot of people object to the scripting. I really like it because I don't have enough hours in the day. I don't have to think about the questions to ask, right? right. And then the other thing is it's really expensive yeah so it's about twice the price of real science odyssey the last time i priced it out it's about four times the price of the elemental science so if you skip the kit you can buy just the consumable student materials for about 65 bucks a year the teacher's manual you can buy separately i bought a used copy off ebay for like 20 bucks but it's again it is a substantial financial investment you know i have to say because you know we we just revised the well-trained mind and uh, put all new, you know, resources, particularly for science. We we had a lot of new recommendations, and I was just really struck that when you're dealing with science, particularly once you get up into the middle grades and high school, that you get what you pay for. It's really, especially if you're going to be doing high quality labs and activities, it is very, very difficult to do it on a shoestring. So as you're planning your curricula, I think as your children get older, you've got to balance out what you're spending um, on their educational supplies and leave sort of a disproportionate amount for purchasing science materials. Because it's like you say, Courtney, if the kit is great because everything is there, but you know, you're going to, you're going to pay for that. You're going to pay for having all of those supplies organized and in the right place. Now you can resell the kits. They maintain their value. So if you're that kind of person who likes to sell one year and then buy the used next year, you can do that. So just FYI. Okay. So that's, that's, uh, all right. So Nancy Larson, something for people to go Google and have a look at. So the next one uh, in between those in the rough years, <laughs> I <Yeah>. bought uh, <laughs> Blossom and Root, which is also not cheap. Mm -hmm. right? This is a, this is a pretty expensive thing. I, I don't remember how much I paid. I want to say it was like 120, if I recall correctly. Right. And I was kind of hot under the collar when I, when I, opened it up because it's I would not call it a curriculum mm. I would call it a curated list of hands-on science ideas it's mm. very pretty it offers lots of ideas for going outside it's highly like aesthetically pleasing it's very instagrammable mm -hmm. and I was just like I was so annoyed but a lot of people let me know that they liked it because they don't have to feel guilty about getting behind <laughs> is it well, that's, that's kind of a hmm, I don't know how I feel about that <laughs> <laughs> I think you have to watch out for these gorgeous new curricula sometimes sometimes the um, quality of the graphic design does not align with the quality of the pedagogy hmm. or teaching um, there's a lot of pretty like you said Instagrammable stuff out there and just because something looks great doesn't mean it's giving everything it needs to be as a curriculum. Hmm. Well, and I think also doesn't, I mean, Blossom and Root has a pretty rabid fan base, don't they? I mean, the people who are really get, as you talk about being hot under the collar when you unpacked it, I think there are people who get hot if you criticize it. Oh, I don't even, I, we, I, I did a podcast once where we broke it down like line by line. And that was the, the people were very unhappy and they let us know about it. Oh, we might get some angry emails <laughs> for this one. So talk a little bit more about if you say it's a curated list of, of ideas. So this doesn't sound to me like it would be a logic stage thing at all, because it doesn't sound to me like it's sequential or um, orderly. No. And in fact, it's they explicitly tell you that you can do like 
quote unquote. For example, you may want to save the unit on aquatic plants for your spring break trip to the Lake District, or perhaps you want to study conifers in the winter, end quote. How nice to think that I may have a regular spring break to the Lake District. <laughs> it kind of sounds like you might want to save the the lesson on mold for when you visit Pemberley and have tea there. <laughs> <laughs> but because it's not sequential, you're not building on prior learning. So there is no requirement that your child learn any specific thing, which means that, you know, if there's no requirement that they learn something, there's no requirement that they learn anything at all. Right. right. So like one of the lessons is making invisible ink with lemon juice, which is great you know, fun craft, but also if you're not like a chemistry person, mm -hmm. it would be very difficult to talk about acids and bases and heat application and all that good kind of stuff. You know, mm -hmm. there's not support for that. Mm -hmm. um, and so students are never explicitly, at least in the second grade curriculum that I looked at, never explicitly told, for example, what chlorophyll is. Right. And maybe mom and dad bring that in and maybe they don't. And if the, if the kids are unlucky, too bad, so sad, there's no reinforcement. Gotcha. So, you know. So definitely more of a definitely more of an elementary exploration. It does mm -hmm. sound like it could be fun if you're willing to pay, pay the money for um for doing that exploration as opposed to, I don't know, going to the library and checking out books with ideas in them, which would be free. And we'll be right back. The Well-Trained Mind Academy, founded by Susan Wise Bauer, offers live online instruction and classical teaching methods that fit your students' educational plan. Our instructors are highly qualified in their fields and have years of experience in teaching, tutoring, and homeschooling. We work closely with students, parents, and instructors to create an educational environment that fits the needs of each family. From calculus to Japanese to essay writing to medieval history, the Well-Trained Mind Academy offers 150 courses for grades 5 through 12. Visit WTMAcademy.com to learn more. All right, moving on. Then, what did you buy next, Courtney? <laughs> well, at more in the rough years, I bought this scientific, <laughs> it was true, scientific connection through inquiry, which is based specifically on building foundations of scientific understanding. And my running joke is it is the best, worst science curriculum for elementary school. Okay, explain <laughs> so, that. So, um, you know, BFSU, or the Building Foundations of Scientific Understanding, I think has a fabulous design, fabulous questions, fabulous, like, hands-on kind of things, but also it is incredibly difficult to use. Yeah. One of my pet peeves, good curricula that are hard to use. So hard. And and I'm a pretty sciencey person, but like I would have to sit down and refresh myself on the science behind it every t every lesson for even for like first grade. Uh. <laughs> And so I'm just like, mm. so when I heard that somebody was making this, this curriculum better, I was interested. So I bought level three, which is BFSU volume two, and I sat okay. down with it. So BFSU is level three of the scientific connections through inquiry program. Right. So volume two of BFSU, volume two is supposed to be third, fourth and fifth grade. OK. So, All right. so this is level three, which would be like the third grade selection. OK, gotcha. And it does. It covers like a third of the material. So that, you know, that was totally cool. And so I, specifically, I looked at lesson B13 and they did, they kind of slowed it down. Uh, there was two sessions recommended in BFSU, four sessions in SCI, the Scientific Connections Through Inquiry, mm -hmm. which I thought was nice, you know, good idea to break it up. They, they kept the same equipment kit, except they added a methylene blue stain for animal cells as a prep material, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, they added extra directions for 
how to use a microscope, uh, and lit fields of view, which is, I thought was also good. And it's beautiful in terms of like aesthetics. It's the mm-hmm. graphic designer for whoever it is, was super talented. No so comic it, sans. It, no comic sans. It's very pretty. But also, it, at least when I bought it, it was only in PDF, hmm. mm, which is fine, except hidden cost. Hidden cost. Now, I invested in a laser printer and and so I print my own stuff. So it wasn't like a deal breaker for me. But if you need to print that out, it's going to it's gonna cost you some money. Right. Because there is a student book that has beautiful, colorful pages, but you need it not just in black and white in color as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, if, if I may go on a slight rabbit trail, <laughs> this is a bit of a sore point with me. If you're going to publish a curriculum as a publisher, part of your job is to print it for people so that they can use it. You know, if you want it, we have PDF versions of all I almost all of our things, although not the things that are disposable necessarily, but you know, people use them because they're traveling overseas or you know, they're trying for a number of different reasons. But if I go to all the trouble to develop a curricula, I'm going to have to believe in it enough to make the investment of printing it out, binding it, and making it available to people in a format that is good for kids to learn. Mm-hmm. And and I, I do, there are more and more, I feel like, of these small publishing companies that are producing these materials and putting them out as PDF only. And I don't find that to be very customer friendly. I spend a lot of time, and even though I have my own printer, I spend a lot of money you know, re- repeatedly throughout the year on printing materials for my children. It is. I mean, that adds up. Yep, it does. It does add up. Um, And then often I feel like often the purchase price of the curriculum doesn't reflect the fact Mm -hmm. that you're going to have to put all of this additional money into printing. So that's definitely something to be aware of. You know, this is one of those programs, Courtney, that we have looked at numerous times because I like the idea of it so much. But, you know, one of our principles at The Well-Trained Mind is that we want things that busy parents can use without wanting to shoot themselves. (laughs) And this just every time I get into it, I'm like, okay, this is making my head hurt. And I don't have a toddler running around. I, mm-hmm. you know, I just, I all, I keep running up against this with this like wonderful content that's just so hard to use. Well, and the SCI, I don't think fixed that problem. Mm-hmm. It's very pretty, um, but it actually doesn't cover as much. It's still really text heavy. And those key questions, the things that you need to discuss with your student are still not called out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, you really have to put the time in and there are no samples and questions and answers and it doesn't make my life any easier. (laughs) So. Okay. So, so we're not, we're not giving this one a good score for usability. Nope. Not so much. All right. Actually, I, I'm looking, guys, we, we, you guys can't see this, but we have we have an outline that we work off of when we when we do these podcasts. Um, we just sort of have it in front of us, you know, just as a guide to our conversation. And I'm still scrolling through all of your notes on this program, Courtney, because you had so many more things to say about it. Um, so of, of the next three pages of commentary on it, are there one or two other things that you'd like to highlight or shall we move on? Well, OK, I'll, I'll, real quick, real quick. One is that it involves a lot of cutting and pasting, which is not which is a no go at my house because Hmm. I have a child with dyspraxia, fine and gross motor difficulties and cutting and pasting literally hurts, Mm -hmm. literally hurts. So like I'd have to take it to the OT and be like, can you make this friendly for my child? Mm. Like this is not great, Bob. Not great. And the other thing is. the SCI cuts out that historical background that we were just talking about as being oh, so important. Interesting. And, mm. and when you do that, if you get into the nitty gritty of teaching, you start talking about schemas or in the well-trained mind, they call those, those pegs, right? You know, mm-hmm. the yep. pegs. You, they cut out the pegs. There's nowhere mm. to hang your hook. Mm-hmm. There's nowhere to schema build. And I, and it makes me very cranky. So. Okay. <laughs> this curriculum makes you cranky. It does. <laughs> so close, but so far. Oh, I feel like we want to we want to give these like chili peppers or something to represent your crankiness factor with each one of them. OK, well, then let's. So so a lot of these have been, although I think some of the curricula we've talked about do have a logic stage extension. Most of them have been more directed towards elementary student. So let's 
let's talk about ones that are more directed at the logic and rhetoric stage. And I think it'd be a good time to start talking about online courses, obviously, mm-hmm. Well Trained Mind Academy, um, which you know I I um, started along with uh, uh, some a number of talented administrators and teachers. Um, so I am a fan of online education when it is done well, which I think we do. But what are your thoughts, uh, Courtney? <laughs> Recognizing that you are also biased in this direction, well, this is what I do. I've been doing this since the year two thousand. Been doing it for just a little while, um, and so I. You know, obviously, I, I do it and I enjoy my job and I really mm-hmm. like it. And I, I work for the Well-Trained Mind Academy, in case you all didn't know. So, And I do online courses for my own children because mm-hmm. I find it's much easier to find an online course that suits my family's schedule versus maybe something down at the local co-op. It's a little trickier. And I can, I can get access to people who are real experts in their fields, like with PhDs and stuff, which is super nice. And as a teacher looking at it from the other side, I find that parents often, especially at the logic stage, yeah, sometimes I, I joke that I have a job because this is when children get argumentative very frequently with the parents, right? And yes. And I will do that arguing for you. <laughs> <laughs> why is that question wrong? Well, I'll be happy to tell that 13-year-old why that question is wrong. <laughs> and so, and then I think one of the nice ones, um, nice points of online classes that is overlooked is that when you take a face-to-face class locally, you're limited to just the children in your local area, right? Mm-hmm. But if you take an online class, like I teach, I've had students in Alaska and Abu Dhabi and Australia all in the same class. Mm -hmm. It really lends to to like learning about other places in the world, just even incidentally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's that. And the downside is that like I can do a lot as an online teacher, but I can't do everything. There are really, truly some things that just don't lend themselves well to online learning. And sometimes hands-on activities are part of that. Like science labs can be tricky. So um, I was teaching a a chemistry lab, not last year, but the year before, I think. And one of the students spilled one of their reagents, just spilled the whole bottle. Right. And if I were in like a face-to-face classroom, I could go back into my cabinet and be like, okay, well, here we go. Here we go. But I couldn't, I couldn't tell the student that, right? Mm-hmm. So they had to like go order some more and it took a while to get there. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So like that was a problem. Um, and then there, of course, there are virtual labs. And then of course, you know, if they spill their virtual reagent, we don't have to worry about it so much. But they also have a steep learning curve. And what I found is that students don't really like virtual labs. Mm. I thought that was really interesting. Mm. No, I can I can see that. I mean one of the one of the appeals of a lab is that you get to do something. You right. know? Mm-hmm. Um, and if you are taking your you're doing your lecture online, you're turning in your work online, and then you're doing your lab online, there's like no texture to that. There's 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 no variety. I, I agree that that is that is definitely a drawback of doing an online doing an online science course. We did, by the way, before we move on, Suzanne and I did a whole uh, episode with Julia Collier, who's the dean of Well Trained Mind Academy, about how to evaluate online courses before you sign your child up. And I think for science in particular, it's really important that you have live teaching and live instruction with a teacher that you can interact with and ask questions of and get help from. A lot of online high school science courses directed towards homeschoolers are actually recorded lectures that the student listens to and then, you know, does a certain set of assignments and they may get feedback on the assignments, but you don't have that, that interaction with an actual science teacher, which is the whole point of doing a course. Otherwise you might as well honestly just get the textbook and, you know, it's the same information just printed instead of delivered um, in a, in a teaching video. So if you haven't heard that episode, you might want to go back and listen to it. But if you're evaluating online science courses, let me just put in a plug for live instruction with a real person. Mm -hmm. Like Courtney. (laughs) I'm happy to teach them. But you can't always do a live class. And maybe you have a student who, for whatever reason, really wants to do it in the home. 
or maybe you really want strongly want to do it in the home. Mm-hmm. The high school science I have found is kind of tricky. One of the ones that I'm using right now, actually for my, uh, she'll be a junior next year, uh, is elemental science. And they have for free chemistry and biology scheduled. Okay. So they're using the CK12 book uh, and they suggest online labs, but I I bought a, a hands-on lab to do with. Um, and it's not super, super rigorous, although they offer um, an honors option, but it does get it done. And, you know, you really do need biology and chemistry as your two basic sciences in high school, I think. Okay. So elemental science high school, not super rigorous, but adequate. Is that fair or is that too lukewarm? I would I would put it up against, you know, my local high school's chemistry and biology. Oh, okay. I mean, you know, the thing the thing about homeschooling, right, is we have those long tails. And so we have, I have a lot of super gifted students and I have a lot of students with disabilities and sometimes with the same student. Right. 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 Um, so when I think about super rigorous, I'm thinking about like those students who are like, one time I was teaching art of problem solving geometry and the youngest student was eight. Oh, wow. <laughs> she got a, she, she did well, you know, um, but you know, so what I think about rigor is something about for those kind of students. Sure. Sure. So if you're more of a science centered household, this might not be the best, but if you're ready to get it done and focus on other things, it'll do the job. Uh, you know, even if you're a science centered household and you just don't want to spend, you know, hours every day. Right, right. <laughs> All right. Then we've got, I think we've got, a, we've got what, we got three more to talk about. Um, I would love to see your bookshelves, by the way, Courtney. Um, <laughs> okay. So the next thing that you bought and tried. Okay. So this I actually bought earlier, um, which is Build Your Library. And I really think Emily Cook is a genius at putting together book lists that are more than the sum of their parts. Oh, interesting. So for example, she has as eighth grade, a history of science course. And I really think you could bump that up to like a high school level really Mm. um and it's fantastic those courses are fantastic for a student who are voracious precocious readers Mm -hmm. got one of those students who just loves to read it is great and when my oldest did it she'd bring me something she'd read every day with a mom mom did you know (laughs) oh we love that we love that and so it is a literature-based curriculum so it's weak on the hands-on science portion um, right there was almost no lab with it there was very little review there's no like worksheets or tests or those kind of formal assessments or reinforcements so yes good eh, about rigorousness so maybe though i mean it does sound like it would be a lovely logic stage project particularly for a kid who is self-motivated and really enjoys exploration. And if you wanted to beef it up with some some more labs and stuff, you could you could I think maybe probably do high school out of it, but Okay. Um, so but one of the things that I think it's underlooked is the CK12 Foundation. It's one of these Sil- Silicon Valley foundations. It's been around for a while. They offer free high quality science and math materials for students. And a lot of school districts use it because it's free. Um, and one of, the th- one of the cool things that you can do is you can customize their textbooks. I call them flex books to include just the information that you want. So years ago, when my very precocious oldest child was obsessed with dinosaurs, I went to my local university. I got the syllabus for Paleontology 101, and I made her a middle school level paleontology book out of the CK-12 things. And it has videos and quizzes and assessments and tests and workbooks and lab books, but they don't have science lab per se. So if you want a science lab, you got to get a kit. And I think, I think it's the home scientist. Yeah, it is home scientist. We were looking at those when we did our our recommendations for the new well-trained mind. All right. Awesome. I remembered. (laughs) So yeah, they offer those kits that are correlated, which are pretty neat. And this is, this is, I believe it's just a letter for those of you who are listening, letter C, letter K dash 12. But um, Susanna, maybe we can put Mm -hmm. uh, the names of these programs that we're talking about in our show notes. Yeah, we'll list all of them in the show notes. So if there's one that sticks out to you, you want to look into more, you can quickly link to it. Yep. Yep. Okay. Then finally, 
Finally, we have Centripetal Press, which I did last year. Um, and if you have a student who is really into science and a really strong reader, and they enjoy a rigorous textbook, but perhaps they're not equally strong in mathematics, mm. and you want regular review, and you want quizzes, and you want tests, and you want a full year schedule all laid out ah. for you, and you want a science kit you can just buy in a box, then this, I think, is a really good program uh, i used it for physical scientists science for my eldest from middle schools not not the high school level like they offer middle school as well okay. um and you can buy lesson plans that match up perfectly with their textbook and you can buy the home science training tools lab kit mm -hmm. for and i think it, it, is that novare yeah it's novare Novari, Novari is general chemistry and use that. Now, that said, it's the secular version of Novari, which, you know, it has a reputation as an academically strong Christian science program. And I think the centripetal is also academically strong. When I talked about using it, I had people get really hot under the collar mm. about it being neutral because it does incorporate intelligent design arguments. So if that is a, a flashpoint for you, you should keep an eye on that. Yeah. And, and this is this is something that comes up again and again as the closer you get to high school, right. the harder it is to simply avoid the issue at some point with your high school student. You're just going to have to choose. You know, I, and I will say, as someone who has been in higher academics for many, many, many years, that programs that teach creationism and intelligent design are not well respected um, for the most part about, by university science departments. So if science is something that you want your, your high school student to go into at a high level in university, that has to be a consideration as you're choosing their high school program. Oh, my goodness. So um, one one of these days, Courtney, you're going to have to give me a list of all the science programs you haven't tried yet. <laughs> um, <and laughs> that list might be shorter than the ones I have. <laughs> <laughs> it might be. I, I think that maybe what parents can take away from this, though, is that maybe you don't just keep looking for the perfect science program. You know, maybe you just got to choose something, stick with it for a bit and see if your kid is thriving with it. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't sound to me like there's, a, you know, any one of these programs. And honestly, none of the programs that we recommend in the new, um, in our new online portal for the well-trained mind are programs that were so good or so easy to use or intuitive that I thought this is it. I have finally found a mm -hmm. recommendation that I can give to almost everyone. I think we just keep, we just keep looking and trying our best. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your journey with us, though, because it seems like it was quite the journey to to try all of these programs. Courtney bought all these programs so that you don't have to. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Pretty much. I did. I literally did buy all of these that we have talked about today. I have them on my shelves. Just FYI, folks. This might have to be your next book. <laughs> there are tons not of science programs. <laughs> Get some of that money back. <laughs> Courtney's walk through science. <laughs> I like that idea. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for listening. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And we'd love to hear from you, your thoughts on classical education, home education, school education, any kind of education that interests you. Or if you found the perfect science curriculum that we Tell haven't about told, it. talked about yet, yes, please do reach out to us at podcast at welltrainedmind.com. Thanks for listening.